Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> um, Sandra. I um, started this lecture with a piece of music. Uh, can I, does anybody remember? Does anybody know where that music came from at all? Yes, absolutely right on. Uh, it, it actually came from... Uh, Two thousand and one, a space odyssey, a film made in nineteen sixty-eight, <coughs> and um, to my mind, the greatest science fiction film yet made. Uh, even though the special effects uh, back then appear to be somewhat dated now, the reason I'm opening this lecture with this is because it was the first time that <coughs> anybody in the world of film or or reality had come to grips with trying to design the interior of a space station. And this is a shot from the um, third part of the film where the, um, the interplanetary spaceship is en route to Jupiter. And uh, in this particular sequence, um, Douglas Trumbull, who was Stan Stanley Kubrick's um, uh, wizard, special effects wizard, uh, built a rotating set uh, because it was impossible to simulate uh, the weightlessness of a space station 
um, on, the, uh, on the ground due to gravity, he actually built a rotating set uh, in which the astronauts appeared to, uh, to jog and run around this large torus-shaped uh, chamber, which is the first time that uh, anybody tried to do that. And just 30 years later, after that film was made, the real thing started to happen with the first, um, the first, the launch of the first piece of the International Space Station in 1998. Considerably short period of time when you think about it, with all the technical challenges that were involved. So this is a view of the final version of the International Space Station as it was completed in about. Uh, uh, about 2010, uh, um, looking from the aft end of the station, from a spacecraft coming in to dock with the station. The station is flying up, uh, up in that direction, and the spacecraft's coming in from behind. Here you have a cluster of modules. This is the cluster of pressurized modules. The main uh, truss structure about 100 meters long from side to side and the main solar arrays. And there is a computer drawing of it. Um, so essentially, it's if you take the letter H and the letter T, this, if this is the letter T, the, the crossbar of the capital letter T, and the crossbar of the capital letter H are common with this truss structure. So it's in a very simplistic way you can describe the station as a combination of the letter T and the letter H. And that's a view of it taken uh, by an amat amateur astronomer in um, Australia about four or five years ago uh, using a telephoto lens, a uh, remarkable photograph of the station transiting the moon up there in the top right-hand corner. Now, uh, normally in this lecture I move on and talk about the, the history of the station, but because this is a series, this, is, this lecture is part of a series on extreme environments, um, I'm going to sidetrack slightly and talk about <coughs> some of the design issues of designing a space station, any space station in orbit. And the first big difference is that unlike a building on Earth which is firmly uh, sunk into the ground or attached to the ground on foundations, it doesn't move, it's static, the space station exists in weightlessness in a vacuum. So you have to give it some system of orientation, some system of coordinates to uh, understand how it moves around the Earth and relates to other objects in space. And essentially the station borrows from the aviation industry in terms of describing the attitude of the station. It's, if you consider it as a building, a flying building is really what it is. Um, it has a, an attitude system based on roll pitch and yaw, which you find in the aviation business, with the roll axis being the x-axis that gives it the, um, the movement in the direction of flight, in this direction. And then you have the, um, <coughs> the pitch axis, which is the angle uh, or the, the angle of attitude the, the station flies in relation to the flight, flight path, and then you have the, the your axis from side to side. So you have x, y, and z axes to do that, and then you have issues to deal with, uh, such as the impact of the space environment on that attitude, where you have orbital drag slowing it down, you have the need to reboost from the back of the space station, using um, spacecraft that come into dock to lift the space station orbit from time to time because it loses several kilometers every year. And then you have the issue of how it flies in relation to its flight path, whether the, the, long, um, 
the long truss structure is actually perpendicular to the flight path or whether it tends to, uh, to fade slightly to one side or the other or like that. And to counteract those very small movements, you have what you call gyroscopes, which are a very fast spinning momentum wheels in the middle, uh, which you use to, to exchange momentum with the station to change the attitude very slightly to make sure it's flying straight and level. Then you have rendezvous and docking. Once you've got the thing flying as you want it to fly, uh, you, have, uh, you need to locate the airlocks uh, in those parts of the station where they're going to be able to receive incoming spacecraft from the forward end the backward end, from above, and from below. So that when you start designing the, the actual kit of parts of the station, um, you need to be able to put those docking airlocks at the extreme points of the overall structure. Then you have the number of delivery missions. And this is something we don't really think about when we're designing buildings on the ground because it's a contractor problem how many trucks, how many lorries he needs to deliver the steel frame to the site, uh, the, the glass structure, the glass walls, whatever it happens to be. But in space, it's very, very important because the, the greater part of the cost of anything in orbit around the Earth is the delivery cost on the rocket that's going to launch it to the site. And so you want to reduce the number of delivery missions down as much as possible to reduce the overall cost. And so you're trying to fill the payload bay of the shuttle or rocket or whatever vehicle you're using to deliver the station as efficiently as possible with the kits, with the, the, the kit of parts, the modules and the truss structure that will ultimately form the station. Then you have the most important thing, really, from the point of view of the use of the station, which is the scientific f facilities, the quality of the physical environment in which the scientific research, the laboratories, will function, because that's really what the station is there for, whether it's the science is physiological or biological or chemical or some kind of combination of the three. The... Um, the efficiency and quality of the scientific environment is absolutely crucial. And this means basically on the station, you have to put it right at the middle of the overall structure uh, to avoid a problem called gravity gradient, uh, which I won't get into in detail. I will simply say that the further away you get from the center of gravity, the center of mass of something floating in space, the more susceptible you are to small movements. Uh, so if, for example, the center of gravity was my shoulder uh, joint here, and you put a module on the end of a long arm facing down towards the Earth, um, the shoulder joint is moving uh, in a weightless environment according to the optimal travel of the station round the Earth, where gravity is equivalent to centrifugal force. But when you think about it, the bottom of, the, uh, the bottom of my arm is actually put, is closer to the Earth, and therefore it carries a certain gravitational weight because it's moving at the same speed, but um, it's closer to the Earth. And so you really want to try and avoid putting anything low down or at a considerable distance away from the center of mass of the structure. You have external structure and robotics, very critical for uh, accessing um, the equipment that's outside the station on the structure, whether that's uh, solar rays or thermal radiators, scientific experiments. Uh, you need a railway system, if you like, uh, with a robotic arm and a traveler to move uh, equipment and people and astronauts up and down the structure. Then you have environmental control and life support, which is essentially what you have to have to keep the crew alive inside the station. Uh, you need to be able to control the, the air pressure, the air temperature, 
and the air mixture. Uh, we do that here in air conditioning design on Earth to a certain extent. Pressure we don't bother about, temperature we do, air mixture we should if we're a good air conditioning engineer uh, to ensure that the mixture in buildings, uh, building environments is correctly balanced and that there's plenty of oxygen. In space you have other problems like the removal of, of toxic gases, um, uh, certain types of gas which uh, are produced during the function of the space station, such as, as methane, um, uh, fine particles of uh, mi grains of um, uh, grains of impurities which float around inside the atmosphere, which because they're weightless you can breathe in, so those have to be filtered out on a regular basis. So there are a lot of issues to do with ensuring the air is clean uh, that the oxygen-nitrogen balance is correct, and then how you circulate it between the modules. Is it done through a, a centralized system uh, with air, air handling in, say, the module in the middle, or is it done through a system of independent control throughout the modules? So these are, to some extent, similar to the problems me mechanical engineers have on Earth in designing buildings. <coughs> Then you have electrical thermal systems. Um, you need uh, to give the solar arrays, which provide the station with the power. Uh, in, on the International Space Station, it's about 90 kilowatts maximum power capacity. You need to give these big wings room to move as the station orbits the Earth every hour and a half, 45 minutes in the sunlight, uh, with the sun uh, relatively passing over the station very quickly, and those solar wings need to track the sun uh, in real time uh, in two axes to ensure that they're generating the maximum power, while, while the radiators, thermal radiators, need to point into black space to radiate out all the heat from the inside of the space station. Remembering that there's no convection in a vacuum, and there's no ability to conduct the heat because the station is floating free, so you can only radiate it out. You can't radiate it towards the surface of the Earth because the surface is very bright and will reflect it back. It has to be radiated into black space. And then finally, um, future expansion. Having built your station and got it working and everything's going fine, is there a need for future expansion? where you come along and add modules maybe 10 years, 20 years after the station has begun operation. You add solar arrays to generate more power, so on and so forth. So when you design the station to begin with, you need to be able to ensure that you can plug in these extra bits and pieces uh, without difficulty uh, later on, much further down the line, without interfering with the operation of the original design. So that just gives you a feeling for some of the major top-level design issues involved in, um, in doing anything in the way of a space station in orbit. This was an early design for, a st for the station, the space station dating from about 1984 which was rejected for one of the reasons I mentioned earlier because they had the, the laboratories and the habitat modules at the end of a very long arm where the center of gravity was up here somewhere. And the scientists, when they were first presented uh, with this by NASA, swore and screamed that uh, it was a completely hopeless design. They were very angry uh, because nobody had asked them whether uh, a design such as this, it was called the power tower, would actually work in terms of their, uh, their, <coughs> their laboratory uh, requirements for physical requirements and so that design was rejected in 1986 in favor of uh, the sort of structure that ended up being built. The, the station itself is actually a kit of parts. Um, it's a kit of parts which disassembled looks something like this. There are about 33 separate parts uh, which arrived on orbit on different types of vehicle, uh, mostly on the American Space 
shuttle, which is no longer in existence, but also on European uh, rockets and Russian rockets. And it really was an exercise in a little bit like a construction toy. A little bit like a construction toy like this one, um, uh, where you, you actually buy the kit of parts and then you assemble it to form different things. You've got the modules, you've got the long beams, you've got the electrical cables, so on and so forth. Very similar in concept to a construction toy like this one. And this is, a, uh, this is a kind of composite diagram which shows all the missions that were flown to um, build the space station from the first one in 1998 to the last one in 2010, 2011, all of which went without mishap, which when you think of it, 33, 34 missions or whatever they are, is a remarkable achievement. Different types of rocket, mostly the space shuttle. Space shuttle had two major accidents, as you will remember. Neither of those missions involved space station, a, a space station assembly missions. So the, uh, the actual sequence of missions went ahead without any failure at all. Very impressive achievement. So let's remind ourselves what the shuttle looked like when it was launched. And the handoff to Atlantis' onboard computers. Atlantis now in control of the countdown. 20. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. Atlantis now on the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Outpost. 30 seconds into the flight. Atlantis almost two miles in altitude, almost six miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center already, traveling 500 miles an hour. The three liquid fuel main engines now throttling back to 72% of rated performance, going into the bucket, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. 55 seconds into the flight, all systems operating normally, 900 miles an hour. The speed of Atlantis right now, six miles in altitude, nine miles downrange. Atlantis, go with throttle up. And it made the most extraordinary noise. Uh, I don't know whether anybody went to a, a, a shuttle launch, no. Uh, which I can best describe as uh, when you take uh, fleet potato chips, right? Potato chips, and you throw them in a deep, a deep fryer of fat, and they make that crackling sound, you know, crackle, crackle, crackle. It was exactly like that. Absolutely amazing. <coughs> so, um, human spaceflight really began here back in 1961, uh, in this case with John Glenn's uh, flight around the Earth. He was he spent about four or five hours in orbit in a volume that was less than 1.5 cubic meters, 1.5 cubic meters. And it's improved today, very comfortable environment. This is the cupola on the station where all the astronauts like to go to relax and where they take photographs of the Earth. And I got a bit of video of that. Windows on all sides. And pretty amazing. 
amazing view. Here, I'll play a little bit with the camera. Improve the view a little bit. What do you see? And right now we happen to be over ocean, which happens quite a bit. But even the ocean looks different, different times of day. And I like this view right here where you know, we actually see our spacecraft, the Soyuz that we came up here in, in a progress supply vehicle. new permanent logistics module and SPDM or Dexter. Let's see if you can see it there. I think you can see it. I'll adjust this camera here. There we go. So Dexter is the um, part of the Canadian robotic system here in the space station. Canada Arm 2 is the main arm, and then Dexter is the Dex uh, Dexterous All-Purpose Manipulator. Special Dexterous... Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator. There we go. Late at night, I'm not sure if these things come out right. So, one of the issues is, what is up and what is down when you're in weightlessness? Um, it really depends on your physical position, the relation, or re relationship of your head with your architectural environment. And here's another video that describes that. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules, you'll see they have four sides, uh, and they're put together. That way, we could sort of wa work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself, and your reference changes. So um, that gives you a feeling for initially for the type of weightless environment um, that we're looking at when we come to design the inside of the station. This is just a shot. I threw this shot in. This is the outside of the European Columbus module, uh, which was added quite late in the station sequence, uh, but is now being used very effectively uh, in orbit. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the sequence of reduction of quality of living accommodation on the station. When the project started out in 1984, when I first got involved in it, there were going to be two habitation modules for crew living and two laboratory modules for working. By 1993, uh, due to the need for continuous cost savings that point in time when the station was way over budget, those were reduced to uh, one module of each. And by the time that 1990, oops, by the time that 1998 came around, sorry, uh, that was reduced even further to two-thirds of the laboratory module. That is what the U.S., that was the U.S. scenario, what the U.S. was going to provide. In fact, the U.S. ended up pr providing a module, a uh, laboratory module, roughly the same size as the, um, as the um, European one. So it was a challenge from uh, as far as astronaut accommodation uh, uh, was concerned, where the, the living environment was sacrificed at the altar of budget, um, you know, uh, budget reduction, um, something that we are often faced with when we design buildings on the Earth, when the client comes along and says to 
late in the process. It costs too much money. You've got to reduce the uh, quality of the external cladding. And instead of having triple glass, you use uh, plywood, painted plywood, or something ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous example. But you know what I mean uh, in an office when you're faced with this kind of problem. Um, when I got involved in the project, uh, uh, in my capacity uh, as um, a, an instructor on the faculty, an instructor on the faculty at University of at uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture, uh, and I got um, <coughs> a grant from NASA to build, to design and build with a team of students a part of the station uh, living environment, one of the things that we went through was to try to analyze the actual functions that astronauts performed in, on orbit and reduce them down to some, some major, major, major design factors such as the need for, the need to maximize physical movement as you pass through the module, the need for privacy that, uh, that each astronaut is entitled to some form of personal privacy, usually at night in a private sleep compartment because there's really no, uh, no capability during the day to provide privacy and you don't need it anyway if you're working constantly for 10 hours a day with, without much of a break. There must be hygiene. There is no shower on the space station um, because that was one of the things that was cut out earlier so when you think about it, this facility that cost 100 billion US dollars equivalent doesn't have one shower for the crew. That's quite something, isn't it? So they have dry showers uh, using um, dry wipe downs or wet wipe downs, rather like very large babies' nappies. And there's a need for exercise too. Minimum of two hours physical exercise a day in order to maintain the most basic standard of terrestrial health. Uh, when you take gravity away from the human body, uh, it doesn't respond well. Bones weaken, muscles weaken, and there are all sorts of other problems too. So it's essential that each astronaut uh, spends at least two hours a day uh, taking strenuous physical exercise. Meals, very important. Uh, the one point in the day when you can get the crew together to talk about what's going on is usually when they're having their meal in the evening. Leisure is very important. Um, as we saw before, the cupola with all the windows uh, is the favorite, favorite place on the space station for the astronauts to go to spend their free time just to look out of the window or take photographs of the Earth. Communication, uh, meetings and get-togethers, very important. Um, there has to be some, other, some way of, of crew uh, communication with themselves and with the ground. And then finally, work, essential to provide good ergonomic design in weightlessness uh, to ensure that astronauts working at uh, workstations or desks like this one in the, what they call the neutral body posture in weightlessness, which is very different from the posture on Earth, um, uh, can, um, can sit or rather float in front of a screen or a series of screens and controls in a comfortable manner uh, without having to, to, uh, to stretch their arms or bend their head into a position that would be uncomfortable for hours on end. So this is one of the diagrams uh, taken from a report of uh, that the first report we did for NASA in 1985 that looked at how it's possible to take these giant tin cans and in, install all the equipment that is necessary in, inside. Um, there was a requirement to fill uh, roughly 65% of the volume of these modules with racks containing experiments um, utility systems like the air conditioning equipment that I was talking about earlier, uh, food and other things. Uh, and there are various ways you can design the inside of these modules to accommodate this 65, approximate 65%. Uh, and these were some of the ideas that we came up with. 
uh, that, that the, sorry, uh, the ideas that NASA and its contractors came up with, uh, all based on the rectilinear subdivision of space. Uh, there's a um, polygonal cross-section there, and then we came along and proposed something that was a bit different, where we tried to uh, introduce curve, curvilinear shapes more reminiscent of passenger cabins on commercial aircraft to try and soften the interior volume. So back in about 84, 85, uh, NASA's thinking was very much like this with a square corridor down the center of the module with flat-faced racks on four sides as the astronaut was talking about in the uh, video we saw earlier. And the proposal that we came up with at SIARC, Southern California Institute of Architecture, was this one, where we went for a completely different concept, trying to introduce two levels of movement, one where you could perform an activity down below and then yet have somebody float through above, and then change the geometry of the flat faces to something that was, as I say, more curv curvilinear and softer more reminiscent of an aircraft interior. So this is what they ended up with uh, in the American laboratory module. I mean, can you believe it, right? What, has hap what had happened is that in the early days, in the 1980s, they had no idea how much equipment they were going to need uh, inside the station in the way of flat screen computers, cables, instruments, sensors, all manner of of contraptions which had not been allowed for in the early design. But the racks, the flat racks, were already full of equipment. So they just, you know, they covered the surfaces in Velcro and then just taped it all on top. And uh, not only did they did that, but, I mean, look at it. You know, there's no talk about cable clutter, and there's no color at all except this astronaut who is um, wearing a Hawaiian T-shirt while he's taking time off to play a, an electric keyboard. <coughs> and color becomes very important uh, when, you know, food arrives, for example, oranges, lemons, apples. Um, they bring color in. Astronauts like to play with them. And here is uh, Mark Kelly trying to juggle uh, apples and oranges and weightlessness. But, of course, fresh Fresh food goes very quickly. It's gone in a matter of days um, because it's the thing that the astronauts like to eat the most is something fresh in the way of fruit and vegetables coming up from the Earth. So here is our, um, our uh, guide astronaut again to give you a, uh, an idea of the design of the sleep compartments. Lying down, you just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth, um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but, you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor. But it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep upside down. I can't have it, I don't have any sensation in my head that tells me that I'm upside down, so it really doesn't matter. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books. I've got some clothes and other things that make it sort of like home. I'm coming out. And just for reference, that's one sleep station. This one's another right here. There's one on the ceiling, if you want to call it, right here. And then there's a fourth on the other wall over here. So all of us sleep in a little bit of a, a circle. And I, I think that uh, illustrates very well some of the, uh, the, the main challenge uh, as, as an architect coming to this field is to rid your mind of gravity, right? 
rid your mind of the idea that there's a single reference floor or plane inside the station uh, to which you have to design. There are no floor plans, right? No, f no distinction between floor plans and sections in space. Anything can be a floor, anything can be a ceiling. And I personally, when I got involved in this field in 1984, it took me maybe two years to, you know, clear my mind of all this architectural stuff and, and basically start again uh, with, with, with appreciating design and approaching design as something without any planar reference and, and going from there. And certainly the students that were on my team had uh, the similar kind of problem. With the initial designs, they were drawing plans, sections, elevations, all the sort of things we're used to. And, and that quickly went because they were useless in really in this type of design situation. Um, I talked earlier a little bit about the what happens to the human body in space. Um, you know, on on the Earth for millions of years, the human body has learned to stand upright, and the weight passes down from the head. The head weighs about six kilograms, fully loaded with blood and brain. It goes down the back. You know, and comes out at the side of the pelvis and down the legs, and here we are standing straight. All that changes in, in space because the muscles say to themselves, hey, you know, there's no weight anymore. Let's have some, let's do things differently. And so uh, in space, uh, the, the human body uh, ad adopts a much more sort of simian-like position, a little like an ape or a gorilla, gorilla with the knees bent, the feet out, the back leaning forward and the head down and the arms out. And that is the most comfortable position in space. If you try and adopt a, uh, a standard upright posture in weightlessness, within 10 to 15 minutes you will be tired because your muscles will be working against the natural environment of weightlessness. So that becomes a big design issue. Another one is the, the input-output aspects of uh, human metabolism, uh, things again that we're not really used to here on Earth. We don't, when we design a building, we don't much think about human metabolism, do we? We take it for granted that there'll be water supply, that there will be oxygen because we open the window or it comes through the air conditioning system, that we generate solid waste and liquid waste. We have toilets, we go there, carbon dioxide, out through the window, heat gets um, recirculated or, um, or again, uh, transfers out through the building skin in cold weather. Now, in space, all that, that's no good. You have to take everything into account and essentially what you're trying to, re re what you're trying to do is to create a, an environmental loop uh, where you can uh, recycle, you can recover the water, you can recover the oxygen from the carbon dioxide and you can recycle it as much as possible. And this was a diagram I did for my book in which I attempted to simplify as far as possible exactly what happens in terms of the environmental control systems dealing with, with solid, uh, with uh, water, liquid, with gas and carbon dioxide and so on and so forth. And the ultimate uh, objective of the space station, whether they ever ach achieve it or not, is to have a completely closed loop around here so that nothing is wasted, nothing is thrown overboard and dumped outside, uh, like this particular version where you have methane being, methane being the final waste product of this particular cycle being dumped overboard. If you can deal with something like that, you've got essentially a perfect system. And when you go, you know, when we go to Mars and uh, on long voyages to Mars and, and the Moon, we are simply going to have to, to have a completely closed loop system because it'll be uneconomic to take a lot of stuff along with us that we just throw overboard when we've used it. So we have to, we have to solve that one. The robotic arm on the station is an extraordinary piece of equipment uh, that was built by the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, very similar to the human arm. If you can imagine the human arm with the 
the lower bone and the upper bone and the elbow joint. And instead of having the, the, the shoulder socket, you have a hand up here. So you have a hand at the end of your arm in the normal way, but you take the arm away from the body and you put a hand up here. Um, so it's a two-handed arm. This is very much how the, um, how the, the, can, the Canadian uh, robotic arm works. And essentially, it travels up and down the, the structure on the outside of the station on a little rail car. Uh, and it can grab modules that come in to rendezvous that have been sent up from Earth. Uh, they come in to, uh, they stop about um, 10 meters away from the station. And then the arm goes out and grabs them and then brings them in to berth them at one of the available ports. And one of the most complicated, an example of one of the most complicated maneuvers during the construction of uh, the, uh, the assembly of the space station was uh, summarized, summarized by this drawing where this was when the space shuttle had delivered a piece of the truss structure, this piece you can see here. Um, it was taken out of the, uh, the, the payload bay by one arm, the one we've just seen, then it was handed to the space shuttle arm because the space shuttle, had, space shuttle had its own arm while the big arm moved out of the way and then it was handed by that arm back to the first one which then moved down towards the end and at the most extreme uh, range of that arm it was moved right out to the end and plugged in uh, here, and that was one of the most difficult operations towards the end of the assembly sequence on the space station. And uh, as I mentioned before, the arm is also used to move astronauts uh, out, astronauts who have got a job to do down the end of the truss structure, travel on the rail car on the arm, uh, down to the site, the work site, rather than having to clamber over the structure themselves much easier to do it like this. And the arm is operated from workstations on the station and on the ground through multiple, mul multiple screens that you can see here. This is inside the cupola that we saw earlier. Uh, and all the screens are out. And this astronaut is um, in the process of moving the arm on a particular job. And uh, on the sequence we saw, there is this extraordinary um, piece of equipment called Dextra, which is a kind of robotic, uh, a miniature robot in itself with um, multiple degrees of freedom so that it can do all sorts of tricks with tools. And this sequence from the Canadian Space Agency describes the arm quite well. Thank you.
greatly speed it up, and it would never actually move at that, at that speed. Everything happens very, very slowly. Um, Now, uh, what is the station there for? Well, I was uh, talking earlier about laboratories and the need to get laboratories, um, laboratory design, laboratory environments uh, working as efficiently as possible. The output, the results of all this are on this particular website, NASA website called ISS Benefits for Humanity. This website gives a, a pretty good idea of all the positive science that is flowing from the space station from this facility that cost a hundred billion dollars to put up and by the end of the li its lifetime probably 150 billion in uh, by 2024. Uh, literally thousands and thousands of experiments have been carried out so far on the station uh, of which there have been some really important ones and uh, one of the most important ones concerns uh, Mark and Scott Kelly, two twins, both astronauts. Uh, quite a unique situation where it was possible to send one, one twin into space and keep the other twin on the ground uh, so that you could compare the physiology and the metabolism of the two under different conditions. Uh, both eating exactly the same diet for one whole year. Uh, Mark Kelly on the right, who went into space, uh, came back uh, last March. Uh, one of the most significant things that uh, has been found out of his research is the impact of weightlessness on the brain and vision. Because what happens in weightlessness is that there's a, a major shift in fluids in, in the weight of the blood from the lower part of the body up to the head, talking earlier about the, the changes, um, the, the, the physical changes of weightlessness. Um, astronauts often look puffy, they have puffy faces because there's a lot more blood. The blood pressure inside the brain, inside the skull, increases and it has a tendency to push the, the nerve, the optic nerves, uh, at the back of the eyes outward. And that tends to distort the eyeball and a lot of astronauts have been coming back with altered vision, quite serious vision, um, where they become much more long-sighted. And this is very serious in space because uh, it's very important to have very good short distance. I was talking a little bit earlier about, um, about things like dust particles floating around in the weightless atmosphere. Well, there are metal shavings and other things too which, uh, which you need to keep, uh, keep an eye out for to stop, them, to stop you breathing them in. And if your vision uh, cannot pick up close objects like that, tiny little objects, it presents a health problem. That's just one example. Another example is in uh, brain surgery where the robotic arm that I was talking about earlier has had a major spin-off application in the field of neurosurgery, which uh, requires very precise control of surgical instruments that are carrying out operations uh, on the brain. And a direct spin-off application here uh, for uh, neurosurgeons where um, the, um, the surgical instruments are being controlled from screens in a control room outside the operating theater by the surgeons and, and uh, capable of extremely fine adjustments down to fractions of a millimeter at a time in three directions. Um, much more precise and much safer than uh, the human hand when you're doing sort of microsurgery on the brain. So that's another example of a very important medical spin-off benefit that is having, um, uh, that is saving a lot of lives around the world today. So I'm just finishing up with um, a few slides that talk about the international um, relevance and the teamwork involved in the International Space Station uh, when you consider that a lot of these nations were at war with each other 80 years ago, uh, and together they have come 
to build and maintain and operate this uh, extraordinary project. The most uh, striking thing about it, the relationship between the USA and formerly Soviet Union, now Russia, that despite all the arguing and all the problems they have with each other down here on the ground, uh, those problems stop, stop once you get into space because they, there is no room on the space station for political arguments or anything to do with that um, with people from different nations. It is absolutely essential to focus on the job in hand. So um, it's a wonderful example of a project that has kept the peace for many years. And just to underline that international aspect, these are all the major operation centers around the world that are involved in the, the station, uh, ranging from North America to Europe to Asia to Russia, quite uh, a considerable range of, of, of centers and an extraordinary level of teamwork. And that extends to the station itself, as talking again, just to, to underline the fact that you have astronauts of different sexes, of different ages, coming from different nations, speaking different languages, all living together in an extremely confined environment for months at a time. Um, now, the selection process involved in choosing these astronauts and sending them up uh, is obviously rigorous, but there's always room for uh, there's always room for discord. And we don't know whether there has been any discord between people on the station, any conflict, uh, because probably if there has, it hasn't reached, um, it hasn't reached the, 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 the knowledge of the public. But by and large, I think over the years, the 250-odd people, astronauts and cosmonauts, who have gone to the station have got on pretty well together, I think, over all those years. Remarkable achievement. So I'm just ending up, I've come to the end, and I'm just ending up with a piece of video which um, I think you'll like. That's it. Thank you very much.
Does anyone have any questions? Yes. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I think you'd have to start with what rockets or vehicles you have available to launch the bits and pieces. Um, I think that the, the, the station was governed to a great extent by the limits of what those were, the size of the payload bay and so on and so forth. Now uh, the shuttle's gone um, and you have rockets with bigger payload bay. So the first thing you can probably do is increase the diameter of the modules. Second thing is maybe you don't need metal modules. You can have inflatables because there's research going on now in the space inflatables that could change that. Um, uh, I think that uh, all the utility systems have got better, the electrics, the communications, the heating, the, um, you know, the refrigeration, the cooling system has probably all got better. So there is all there is that aspect of it, I think, and um, um, the challenge, as always, would be to to try to, from an architectural point of view, to try to create an internal environment that is as interesting and comfortable uh, as possible for the astronauts, rather than the. It's often been compared to a locker room at a ski resort, right? The interior, it's sort of long and metal and you know, lockers down the side, and how it's possible to introduce um, softer furnishings and things. And the Russians have uh, actually clad their modules with soft fabric, um, which can take Velcro, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a Velcro-type fabric, and you can put anything on it anywhere. And the, the, the American ones and the, and the European ones are just metal-faced. So I think there's a lot of opportunity from an architectural standpoint. Um, the other thing that has happened is that when we started out as architects working in this field in the 1980s, they laughed at us. They said, you know, you're, architect, you're an architect. What, what are you doing, doing here at this meeting? You know, what can you bring to this project? Do you want to choose the color of the walls? You know, and that was the attitude. And it's taken us uh, 30, 35 years to change that attitude. Now you have architects leading uh, all the design projects for the Mars and lunar bases. And there was, there was even an architect until recently who was in charge of all the, the um, uh, planning of sending up the resupplies, the food and all the other equipment to the space station. So, so we have now earned respect in the engineering community and that's been, it's taken us, it's taken us 30 years to do that, right? So if you guys want to get into the field, now you won't have that problem to go through. So. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's, it's fixed towards Earth. Yeah, no, it's always Earth pointing. The reason being that they use it a lot for photography uh, for um, photography using um, just standard um, cameras. So they want to be able to shoot down. And uh, most arriving um, modules uh, come up generally from, from the Earth side so that they can see them more easily as they approach. The, the, the field of view is not blocked by other equipment on the station. Yes. 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 That would have been uh, uh, that would have been a um, a supply module that arrives under its own power, 
and here's the stationers here, it comes in and very slowly and then they stop it about the distance from half the, half the length of this room and then the, the robotic arm comes out and grapples it and then pulls it in. Otherwise you have the risk of a collision which is what happened on the Mir space station where it came in too quickly and damaged the, the structure. Any more questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, in my case, it was purely by luck. I was in the right place at the right time. Yes. Well, uh, I think that um, um, this university has uh, is developing relations, has good relations with the European Space Agency. So, uh, if you are right. Yeah, so if you, uh, and it's the only, probably one of the, uh, it's, this is the only university in Europe at this time that is offering a course in space design through, through Sandra here. There's no one else doing it. So you're in the right place. Um, but uh, I think you'd have to, you'd have to pursue it. Um, uh, you'd have to, to focus on it. Uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, in your, are you doing a master's here or something? Oh, okay. Well, then you have to somehow, I don't know, you have to sort of get into it. Well, a good way to get into it is to go to conferences, space conferences, and learn about it that way, and maybe write a paper on a specific aspect of it, and then get onto it like that, and then maybe apply to the European Space Agency or one of the big European uh, in the, uh, space companies and try and get a job there. It's difficult, it's not, it's not easy. Yes. Yes. Well, space is a very cyclical thing. It's, it's really like a sine wave, and when I was in, got involved in the station, the curve was going up, and um, during the design, uh, design phase of the station that lasted till about uh, the year um, 1990, 92, there was a quite a lot of work for architects, and since then it's been going down. The, you know, the, the plan was that we'd move on from a space station to a base on Mars or the moon. We're all ready to do that, but nothing's happened because the politicians who control the space budgets um, never go to science fiction films, right? They <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> they, know, they, they, um, they don't, uh, there, isn't the same, um, there isn't the same vision today as there was during the time of Kennedy and so on and so forth. Um, and it, it takes, uh, it's going to take a while for um, the curve to start to climb again. And you, what you want to do is to, you know, it could be another 10 years, five years. You want to try and, you know, position yourself. It's like a bit like a ski lift, right? You want to, you want to get on the thing at the bottom and then try and ride up to the top. Um, so uh, it's very much a cyclical time-related thing. Um, if you are uh, really interested in doing it, you, you, can, you can get up to speed in three years, I would think, by reading, by giving papers, by maybe doing a course here at the university, and that would put you in a good position to maybe try and get a job in the field once the, you know, once the situation improves. This is a really bad time at the moment. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 
you know, maximum. Um, they're not sure about the eyes, and they're not sure about, there's certain other things to do with, with the vertebra that they're discovering. Um, muscle, muscles and bones, bone, uh, uh, muscle loss and bone weakness are generally reversible. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is radiation, because in, which I didn't talk about, I should have done perhaps. Um, the, in space, the astronauts will get radiation dosage during the course that they're there, and radiation builds up in the body over course of time, and each, each astronaut has what they, call, uh, what they call a career limit beyond which they cannot go into space again, and that career limit is about a year, year and a half now. Once you reach that, no more space. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's radiation is something that that has yet to be dealt with in design. It's very important to try to reduce the amount of radiation the human body absorbs in space. So you're saying if an astronaut would be at a maximum of one year in space, that would be... That's about it. A bit more, maybe, in the year. But, for example, Mark Kelly, one of the twins, yeah. came back. He can't go into space again because he's reached his limit. So. Well, you know, I mean, the issue of, the issue of designing uh, to shield from radiation is a big, big deal. How can you do that? You know, water is very good as a, uh, as a shield. You know, uh, 100 millimeters of water, that'll deal with it. Or certain types of thermoplastic like, um, uh, gosh, I can't remember, polyethylene is very good. But it all adds weight, see? So it's a trade-off between do you accept the fact that astronauts have more radiation uh, or do you spend more money delivering the, the bulk mass needed to keep the radiation out? And it's, space is always a trade-off between these, these positive and negative issues. Uh, yes. No idea in my head. No, there are multipliers that you can use to, to um, it's really to do with the, the amount of payload, useful payload you can deliver to the moon. Um, to get to the moon, can, you need a lot more fuel, uh, which weighs a lot more, and therefore the rocket has to be bigger. So more and more money goes on the rocket, and there's less and less on the, 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 the important bit at the top, which is what you deliver. And the further you go away from Earth, the more uh, challenging that um, fraction becomes. So Mars, for example, the, the cost of actually mounting the mission is, um, you know, an order of several orders of magnitude, possibly higher than the cost of the, in terms of weight, in terms of what you can deliver. Um, but, and there are actual... Um, uh, there are actual uh, mathematical uh, formulae that NASA's produced that, that you can use to estimate these. The zero gravity. That's the cheapest ways to travel weightless. Yeah. If you try, you know, if you do a 2,000 a rotating thing. To, to create artificial gravity, that, that's a huge cost uh, penalty. Yes, and there was one more, uh, one more question there. Yes? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't think, uh, I, hopefully not. I, I, don't ha I don't know the answer to that. Yes. All right.
Well, there are only cooling systems because um, the, you know, you've got 80 kilowatts of electrical power, which is all generated, all used up, so it's converted into heat one way or another. Maybe a lot of that is outside, but certainly maybe 40, 40, 50 kilowatts is inside the station. You can only radiate that out. You can't convect it and you can't conduct it. So that's, you know, you look at the back of your refrigerator at home, the cooling system, and that refrigerator is what, one kilowatt or something? 40 of those, you've, and that's what you've got to get rid of on a, a, a continuous basis in the way of cooling. So that's the big issue. Yes, that heat has got to, so it's heat, it's cooling rather than, it's cooling rather than heating. It's probably, they probably keep it about 20 degrees centigrade, you know, typical environment. Uh, it's cooler than in here, I would think, yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. Right. Limitations are weight, 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 and weight. <laughs> and the less weight, the better. And I, the ideal, you know, the ideal solution is a thin skin inflatable habitat, which does all the things that the metal does, but is a fraction of a fraction of the weight, which hasn't been invented yet. I mean, uh, something. It, it turns out that it's there's very little weight advantage with fabric structures. By the time you've you know, you've got the, the insulation and the, all the other aspects. So it's really weight. Um, you know, but try and get the weight, the weight down as much as possible. Um, Yes, there are. Architects have been working on that, but uh, it's very expensive because to, to uh, <coughs> again, it's, it's a mathematical uh, set of mathematical relationships to, to achieve one gravity through rotation. The arms need to be a certain length, and that is several hundred, several hundred meters, maybe, you know, maybe one kilometer. I can't remember what it is, but there are a lot of guys who are thinking about this very seriously. Do you need a wheel, or can you just have two arms with, you know, that, that counter rotate, like the one, the aircraft, like the um, the spaceship in the film, The Martian with Matt Damon, you know, the one that came to, to rescue them. That just had two, so that's a possibility. But you know, I mean, it's a it's a major research issue, and nothing's been launched to test it, so. You're starting from uh, sort of just the engineering concept. Um, no one's even built a prototype of it, I don't think. So, you know, you could do that. So. Right. right. It's um, about 4.3 meters diameter, standard module size, about 4.3 meters, roughly from here to roughly the width of the screen. That's the diameter. Now, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're big, a big astronaut, and you extend your arms from side to side inside one of the modules, you can almost touch the two walls, which gives you an idea of how small the corridor is inside through all the modules. You know, it's a claustrophobic, uh, pretty claustrophobic environment. And that's what, you know, all those years ago we were fighting against to try and get them to 
open up the architectural space more to make it more interesting and more efficient to move around in. So it's still, that's still a battle we have to win next time round. So. <laughs> well, it won't be me. But <laughs> might be you, it won't be me. Yes. Well, the film Gravity yeah. uh, was a realistic depiction of the station and the Soyuz spacecraft and the shuttle. That was pretty close. Uh, um, Mars. Well, uh, f f fictional spaceship. Um, I can't think uh, of one. I mean, I think the the Martian film was pretty accurate in terms of the Martian base. It would probably look like that. I don't know about the spaceship. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Any suggestions about realistic science fiction spaceships? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, I still coming back to 2001. The the third part of that film, which is um, the voyage from the Earth to Jupiter, had a very long space station with a, um, a spherical habitat at one end, uh, with the scene of him jogging round, right, and then the. The, uh, the propulsion system at the other end and all the other equipment uh, along the main structure. You know, probably something like that is actually quite realistic for a, a spaceship that doesn't have to go down to the surface of another planet but simply orbits it. Because the minute you go down you and you're into uh, to heating of the module as you go through an atmosphere, that's a big, that's a big challenge too. So. Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. I hope it was interesting. And, um <laughs>